welcome back again. It's good to see you. Let me ask you to turn in your Bibles to Psalm chapter 1. Psalm chapter 1, verses 1 to 6. We are on uh, Sunday nights uh, going through the whole Bible. We're doing it at warp speed, uh, but we are calling this a short series through the entire Bible, and we're calling it Love and Glory. Calling it Love and Glory because these are two key threads that go through all of the Bible. God is passionate about His glory. He is focused on His name and being famous, but His glory is not at odds with His love. And one of the main ways, the main way, that He shows us His love is by showing us His glory. And so we're seeing that uh, throughout the whole Bible. And tonight, we're coming to the Psalms, one of the largest books in the Bible. Uh, it's got the largest chapter in the Bible, 150 chapters right in the guts of Scripture, full of songs and poetry. 150 chapters, we can't uh, swim, swim the length of the pool tonight. We can't even really jump in, but we can splash the water with our toe for a few minutes and, uh, and see how we like it. Uh, we're talking about the Psalms tonight because the last time we were together for Love and Glory, we talked about King David, and King David wrote roughly half of the Psalms, about half of the 150 chapters. Um, other people wrote other things. The sons of Korah wrote some, Asaph wrote some, Solomon wrote a couple, Moses even wrote one. So these are uh, uh, psalms that have been compiled throughout the history of Israel, but they're most closely affiliated with David. So we'll hop into it here. And this is essentially the songbook of the Bible. And uh, we can't, as I said, talk about even close to all of it, but we'll start in a pretty good place right at the beginning and say a few things about it and be done. Psalm chapter 1, verses 1 to 6, this is what God says. How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He'll be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season, and its leaf does not wither, and in whatever he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so. They are like chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Let's pray. Father, here is a text that so many of us have heard, that so many of us are familiar with. And yet, Father, you have brought us together tonight, whether we're in this room or watching online, because you have things you want to say to us from this text tonight. Father, show us your truth. Show us the grace of your Son. Reveal to us your love and your glory. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Listen to this. A saturated meadow sun-shaped and jewel-small, a circle scarcely wider than the trees around were tall, where winds were quite excluded and the air was stifling sweet with the breath of many flowers, a temple of the heat. There we bowed us in the burning as the sun's right worship is to pick where none could miss them a thousand orcuses. For though the grass was scattered, yet every second spear seemed tipped with wings of color that tinged the atmosphere. We raised a simple prayer before we left the spot that in the general mowing, that place might be forgot. Or if not also favored, obtain such grace of ours that none should mow the grass there while so confused 
with flowers. That is a, a poem called Rose Peconius by Robert Frost. And I keep a book of uh, Robert Frost poems uh, in my house. And every now and then, if it's quiet for a minute and I've got some time to kill, I love to pick that book up and uh, read a Frost poem or two. Rose Begonias is one of my favorites. I have it marked and I come back and read it every now and then. And I've wondered, why do I like Robert Frost's poems? Thought about that. Uh, there is a sense in which uh, I like his poems because they remind me of my growing up. I grew up in eastern Kentucky in the country, and he writes about fields and hay bales and birds flying overhead, and he writes about rose begonias and orchises and this kind of thing. And it just makes me think of childhood and the countryside. But I also like it because while he's making me think of these things that I remember with such fondness, he talks about them in beautiful terms. If you're paying attention to Rose Peconias, there's a really boring way to describe the scene that he described. There's a way that I would describe it. Uh, you know, around the corner, there's a meadow full of some pretty flowers, and I hope nobody mows that thing, because I sure like going there. That's the Heath Lambert version of Rose Peconius. The, both things, my statement and Frost, say the same thing, but one is characterized by the beauty and the delicacy of the situation, the sweetness of the experience. And the other is just the boring, just the facts, ma'am, there's some flowers over there I hope nobody cuts down. I want you to see that this is the function of the book of Psalms in the Bible. We have at this point in our journey of love and glory and our journey through the Bible about halfway through, we have seen a lot of law, do this, don't do that. We've seen a lot of history. Let me tell you something that happened. It is crucial. When you get to one of the longest books in the Bible, 150 chapters right in the middle of Scripture, it's crucial that you see that while law is important and history is important, all of those things, law and history and other things, other things that we'll see, they portray God's love and God's glory. But that's not the only way to portray love and glory. God also portrays his love and his glory with poetry, with singing. It helps us, the Psalms do, to capture the love and the glory of God and move beyond just bare descriptions of history, though those are good, and even move beyond law, do this, don't do that, and take a moment Take a season, take 150 chapters to cherish these things as so beautiful that when you think about them and you think about them as they really are, you will sing these things. You'll, you'll want to sit down when you think about who God is in his word, when you've been praying about it and meditating on it, you'll want to sit down and write something beautiful to describe it. That's the function of the Psalms. They help us sing and savor the beauty of God's love and glory as he's revealed it in the Bible. I wanna make a few observations as we kinda of dabble around in this text and think about the Psalms, about the Psalms and what they do for us in this regard. And the first thing is that the Psalms show how love and glory captivate our hearts. The Psalms show how love and glory captivate our hearts. 
the Bible, is full of commands, rewards, punishments, descriptions that are just given to us in a straight up sort of fashion, just bare propositions. In Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 15, the Bible says, it shall come about if you do not obey the Lord your God to observe to do all his commandments and his statutes with which I charge you today, that all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. In chapter 30, verses 9 to 10, the Bible says, The Lord your God will prosper you abundantly in all the work of your hand, in the offspring of your body, and in the offspring of your cattle, and in the produce of your ground. For the Lord will again rejoice over you for good, just as he rejoiced over your fathers, if you obey the Lord your God to keep his commandments and his statutes, which are written in this book of the law, if you turn to the Lord your God with all your heart and soul. These are the rewards and the punishments, the commands. These are the just the facts, ma'am. And there's a time and a place for that. I know that because we read them and there they are. God says, here is my law. Here is what I want you to do. And let me just tell you some things about that. If you pay attention to this law and do it, your life is going to be really happy. Good things are going to happen to you. Take it from me. But if you pay attention to this law, if you pay attention to this word and you ignore it, you don't follow it, then your life is going to be really, really hard and really, really sad. Take it to the bank. That's what Deuteronomy chapter 28 and 30 says, as well as a whole bunch of other places in the Bible. It's just the proposition. Let me tell you the way this is. Let me tell you the way this works. But when you pay attention to those propositions, when you think about them as David did, you start to realize that you can't just receive that information as though input into your brain and understand it and have it have no effect in your heart. The Psalms teach us that we are to sing about those commands. We are to sing about that law. David has been meditating on the law of God. Verse 2 says, his delight, the delight of this man is in the law of the Lord and in his law he meditates day and night. And when he meditates on the law day and night, something starts to stir in his heart. Something starts to happen in his soul. Verse 1 says, how blessed is the man who doesn't walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the path of sinners or sit in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. He's blessed. He's thinking about it. He's like, there's blessing. When you think about the Bible, when you consider the law of God, there is delight. Verse 2. In verse 5, there's absolute horror when you don't. The wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. He, he says this with a tremble and a shiver up his spine. That when you're thinking about the law, when you're meditating on the word of God, and you depart from it, and you make yourself a wicked person, you won't stand. You won't have blessings. You won't have delight. The Psalms show us, as, as, as the authors of the Psalms, the various ones, as they sit down and they write out their reflections on these things, they are the reflections of people whose hearts have been captivated by the Word of God. This tells us how the Bible is supposed to work in our hearts. Some of you have your devotions, you have some Bible reading every day, you should do that. But the Psalms remind us that there's nothing about just reading the Bible that's good in and of itself. You can read the Bible and have a cold heart. 
And the psalmists portray to us that when you think about the Bible as you ought, when you think about the law as you ought, when you consider the word as you should, it will captivate your heart. And you'll be aware of blessing and delight that comes with obedience and of horror that comes with disobedience. The Psalms show how love and glory captivate our hearts. The Psalms also show how love and glory captivate our imaginations. The Bible often speaks in concrete language that is relatively uncreative. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not covet. That's perfectly good language. No criticism here of concrete language. That's in the Bible too. But the Bible also speaks in beautifully powerful descriptive and poetic imagery. We see this in Psalm chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. He's talking about the man, the person who is meditating on the law of God. He'll be blessed. He'll have delight. And he says in verses 3 and 4, he will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither, and in whatever he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff, which the wind drives away. He, he comes up with these word pictures to describe the concrete reality. He could say, um, God will reward your obedience and he will punish your disobedience. But that's not what he says. He adds color. He adds texture to it. It's more like a Robert Frost poem than a description from me of what I hope happens to the meadow. And and cueing off this language, you read through the Psalms and you find that in the Psalms, the portrait of God is not just that God is sovereign and powerful, That's true. That's in other places in the Bible. But you read in the Psalms, and God is a rock. He's a fortress. He's a stronghold. God doesn't just care for his people. He doesn't just watch over them. But as Pastor Sean pointed out a few weeks ago, he's a tender shepherd over his people. What is happening here is God is capturing our imaginations moving beyond just the bare concepts to give a colorful portrait of who he is and who we are. That's what happens in Psalm chapter 1. If you want to know whether you should obey God, you need to think of two things. You need to think of a tree is the first thing you should think of, a beautiful tree that bears fruit. Several weeks ago, uh, some of you know, I uh, went to visit my uh, mama, my uh, grandmother. She's not my real grandmother. She doesn't, I don't have, there's no family relation, but uh, my mom uh, dropped us off at her house. She was my babysitter from the time we were two weeks old. And she babysat her grandkids at the same time. They called her mama, we called her mama. And after a couple of years, she just quit taking money for us because she said, these are, these are my grandkids. And um, She uh, is one of the most influential women in my life. I would not be alive if it were not for this woman. She's 86 now, and uh, I went with my brother to her house in Kentucky. I hadn't seen her in years, and uh, it was amazing to walk through the front yard. This was, look, when I was growing up, there weren't many fun, safe places. But but this is... uh, uh, Mama's house is almost Edenic in uh, its conception in my mind. And I'm walking through the front yard and I see Mama. She comes up to about here on me and I gave her a hug and we were talking. And I went, I went into the back of the house and I'm looking out over the backyard. And I looked over here on the side and I could see where the redbud tree used to be. You know, redbud trees. They're beautiful. 
And uh, the redbud tree that was growing up in Mama's house when I, was, uh, when I was a little boy, it split pretty low towards the bottom. And so somebody, I don't know who it was, went out there and they nailed a board in to where those uh, branches start to split. And we took our crayons out there and we colored it red and yellow and blue and green and we called it the rainbow tree house. And we would sit out there and in the afternoons, Memo would bring us our afternoon snack. And there'd be peanut butter and crackers and apples, apples and peanut butter. I can taste it right now. She would put, this was a Memo invention. I've never seen it before, but Memo would put cream cheese on Zesta crackers. She'd bring out the fruit punch Kool-Aid. Oh my goodness. I can, I can remember sitting out there with three other kids and the tray of snacks in the middle and looking up in the spray of pink from the red bud in the spring and the blue of the sky coming through. I can remember in the springtime the, the breeze blowing and you can smell fresh cut grass and there was the calicanther bush right over here. And it was delightful. It was life. It was safe. It was wonderful. Past the redbud tree into the other yard, I looked and into the next door neighbor's yard. I don't know who lives there now, but when we were growing up, uh, Edgar and Lulu lived there. Isn't that great? Edgar and Lulu. And we would always go over and talk to Edgar and Lulu. And Edgar would uh, burn trash along the property line in the back of his yard. Well, this is exciting when you're a kid. When you're a little boy, you want to see people lighting things on fire. And he's allowed to. If I light something on fire, I'm going to get in trouble. And by the way, that happened. That's another story for another day. It's good enough for Edgar. Why can't I do it? But he would burn his trash out there by the fence row. And it looked fun from a distance, but on a hot summer afternoon when you're sweating and you get up next to that fire and the fire's been burning for a little while and the ash from the fire starts to blow up and get in your face and you're getting singed from the sparks and you smell funny and you've got all this hot stuff poking you, it's very unpleasant. That's the portrait of chaff that's talked about in the text. Chaff is the husk of the wheat kernel that is useless and the wind just blows it away, just like those ashes from Edgar's fire. All you have is the hot unpleasantness of the sticky, acrid smoke, but before long it blows away and it's nothing. The psalmist says, if you want to know what it's like to be righteous, think about that redbud tree. Think about life and peace and joy and beauty. And if you want to know what it's like to not follow God, think about that smoky fire and those ashes that blow by. And after it's unpleasant for a little while, it's never seen or heard from again. God uses the Psalms to capture our imaginations in that way. Not just obey, but be like a rich tree by the water growing fruit. Not just you're in trouble if you disobey, but don't be like chaff that is driven away by the wind and never heard from again. We need to have our imaginations stretched out in this way. We need this, and the Psalms give it to us. The Psalms show how love and glory captivate our hearts. It shows how love and glory captivate our imaginations. And the Psalms show how love and glory captivate our mouths. The psalmist here has been thinking about the law of God. A blessed man, as we're led into verse 2, delights in the law of the Lord. And in this law, he meditates day and night. The blessed man of Psalm 1 is thinking about the law of God. 
And after he thinks about it, and after the other authors of the other chapters in the Psalter, after they've been thinking about the Word of God, it leads them to do at least three things throughout the Psalms. It leads them to pray. Some of the Psalms are prayers to God. When you're thrilled, you don't just experience the joy apart from God because you've been studying the Word of God and you know that this joy comes from the hand of God. And so you call out to the Lord with thanks. Sometimes you get those prayers of joy. Sometimes you're studying the Word of God and terrible things happen. And you don't just experience the terrible thing because you've been studying the Word of God and you know that in the midst of the pain, God has to come through for you or you can't make it. And so you call out to God, God help. God save. God take care of my enemies. God take care of me. God forgive me. He's been thinking about the Word of God and it leads him to pray. Sometimes... He's thinking about the Word of God, and he sits down, and he writes a beautiful, poetic description of God. He's just overwhelmed as he's been thinking about the Lord, and he's trying to find some way to picture it. He's trying to find some way to portray it, and so he says, oh God, you're a a mighty and a strong tower. I, I want to think about something in my mind that makes me feel safe and secure and, and that's a big castle with a big rampart and a tower on it and I'm up there and no arrow can hit me and no enemy can knock me down. That's you, God. He's been thinking about who God is and he's trying to find some way to express it. He wants to hit you in the heart. He, he's thinking about how much care God has for him. And he's he's trying to find some way to put this amazing reality into human language. And he remembers back when he was a little boy to when he had to take care of these sheep. And he never would have done anything to hurt him. And he says, that's you, God. You're this tender, perfect shepherd. And you let me lie down in the cool grass by the water. And I don't have anything to worry about because you're standing there with a rod and a staff. And I know you've got my back. He's been thinking about the word of God. He's been thinking about the law of God. And he puts it in a prayer. Or he puts it in some sort of poetic description. Or he turns it into a song. It's not enough for him to think about God and just go, That's great, God. You're wonderful. And I agree. He's got to do something more than that. And I don't know how the tunes go in the Psalms. I don't know how they go. But it sets the example for us that we're not allowed to just think about who God is and go, yes, it is true. Check the box. God is gracious and kind. Yes. No, you got to go, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found. Was blind, but now I see. It's not enough to read the Bible and look at a pandemic and go, God, you're going to take care of this. I believe it. But if you're thinking about this the way you're supposed to think about it, something has to happen in your heart, and you have to go, he's got the whole world in his hands. 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 hands." Something has to happen in your heart where you shout this out in song. So your heart has to take the next step. It has to move beyond the truth and the fact. And it has to embrace God and His glorious wonder. You gotta sing. You gotta say it in a beautiful way. You gotta pray. The point is, the Psalms show us how to give voice 
to the truth as it impacts our heart. It captivates our mouth. And this is important. And I want to speak to guys here. I want to speak to the men in the room or the soon-to-be men. And I want to tell you why. And this is depending on uh, who's listening or who's watching. This isn't going to go over very well. Uh, But this is just the way it is. God has raised up in the church and in the home leaders who are men. It's not that there's no such thing as women who lead. It's not as though women can't or shouldn't lead. It's that God has given the preponderance of spiritual leadership to men. So that if you show me a home that has a weak spiritual leader, I will show you a home that's in trouble. And if you show me a a church that is characterized by weak spiritual men, I'll show you a church that's in trouble. And I want to say to men who are called to lead, in part because you're called to lead and in part because you struggle with sins that women don't struggle with. The the Psalter here is a call to us to embrace this tender side of life, to embrace the poetic and the soft and the beautiful. It's not at odds with toughness. There is tenderness and toughness that go hand in hand. And the way I know that is because David wrote more than half of them. And do you remember the last time we saw David, a couple of weeks ago, David was killing a giant. He killed him with one rock, and when he fell over, he ran over with the sword, and he cut off his head, and he lifted it up with the blood dripping out. And he took it to King Saul, and he plopped down the giant's head, and he went over and he started playing the lyre. If you're listening, that's a musical instrument. He he started playing a musical instrument called a lyre. And he wrote songs. Tough David, who will kill and decapitate a giant, will write beautiful songs about the Lord. We as men need to be tough, yes, but we need to be tender too. We need to be men who are gripped by the words of the Psalms that allow our hearts to be carried away into singing and beautiful descriptions of the Lord. Not that women don't need to do that too, but in my experience, women find it easier to do that. And men, if we're going to lead, we have to be able to lead in this way. And if David isn't good enough for you, then think of Jesus. He's the epitome of tender and tough. He's the lion and the lamb. He is the one who comes with a sword out of his mouth, and he's described as a shepherd. He sits in judgment over his enemies, but not before he dies on the cross. He's tender, and he's tough. And thinking of Jesus is what you have to do when you read the Psalms. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. I don't know about you, but I read that, and it's not a comfort to me. Because too often, my delight is not in the law of the Lord. Too often, I do not meditate on the law of the Lord day and night. So these verses on their own are not a comfort, but an indictment of my heart and an indictment of your heart. If you want to find the man who meditates on the law of the Lord day and night and finds his delight in the law of the Lord, he can't look within. You have to look without, and you have to find Jesus. 
Jesus, who lived every moment of his life delighting in the law of the Lord, who as a 12-year-old boy is taking the sage old men to school. Because as a little boy, he has to meditate on his father's word, and he has to be in his father's house. And as a grown man, he never loses a debate with people who've been to school and studied longer than he has in a formal way. Because he loves the word of the Lord. He loves the law of God. And he dies on the cross to pay for the sins of you and me. Sins of people who don't love the Lord. Sins of the people who don't meditate on the law of God. And he rises from the grave. And we can repent of our sins and find in Psalm 1, his name's not mentioned here, but it shows up later, that the man who delights in the law of the Lord, the man who meditates on the law day and night, is not me and it's not you. It's Jesus Christ, the good shepherd, whose glory is seen and doing perfectly what the Word describes, and whose love is seen, and fulfilling that for you when you repent and trust in His name. Let's stand and let's pray. Father, captivate our hearts. Captivate our imaginations. Captivate our mouths. With you. Show us who Jesus is. Show us what he has done. Move us to pray as we're doing now. Move us to glorious and great descriptions of our Christ who's a shepherd, of our Christ who's a lion, of our Christ who is a lamb, of our Christ who makes us safe lambs and soft green meadows by crystal clear streams, of our Christ who protects us in the mighty and the strong tower that is his person and in his work. Father, captivate us with Christ and cause us to sing. As we sing here together, I pray we tell the truth. I pray that reflecting on who Jesus is and what he has done would lead us in our hearts to worship him by singing and to sing of his grace and his grace alone. We pray you do it now in Jesus' name. Amen.